This is Martha and she's agreed to help us today to demonstrate the physical examination of a mature fistula. First thing we'd like to do is just get some information. Martha, how long have you had this fistula? Four years. So it's four years old and it's being used for dialysis. Mm -hmm. Do they ever have any trouble with the needles? Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh -huh. What sort of trouble do they experience? Um, Difficulty with sticking it? Yeah, and sometimes stop the machine. Uh huh. Do they and do they when they stick it? Do they use a tourniquet? Mm hmm. Have you noticed any change in the, in your fistula in the last weeks or month or even the last year in the appearance of it? Mm hmm. What sort of change? It's getting lumpier. It's getting lumpier. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's identify what type of fistula we have here. This is an upper arm fistula, of course, which makes us think that it's either going to be a brachiobacillic or brachiocephalic. Now, a brachiobacillic and a brachiocephalic would both often be in the same position, but if we look for scars, we see that there is no scar. If this is a transposed brachiobacillic fistula, we would expect to see a scar on the medial aspect of the arm where it's been transposed. So the fact that there's no scar there makes us think this is a brachiocephalic fistula. The reason that it's important to distinguish between those two is there's some common problems that occur in a brachiobacillic and a brachiocephalic. The swing point here where the, the vein has been moved laterally is a point of where stenosis frequently occurs. So in a brachiobacillic you'd want to pay close attention to that area. With a brachiocephalic, as this is, the cephalic came, comes up and there's a cephalic arch where it enters into the subclavian vein. That arch area is also a swing point and is a common area for stenosis to develop. So in a brachiocephalic, we want to pay close attention to that area as well. The other thing we'd like to do is look at the general appearance of the skin to see if there's evidence of inflammation, redness, swelling, fluctuance, uh, tenderness, we don't see anything like that here. Look for area of bulging, and she's noticed that her fish is becoming lumpy, and as we examine it, we see that it is developing some aneurysms. We see areas of discoloration, increased pigment here where it's being cannulated, and it looks as though it's being cannulated in very limited areas. If you look at the depth of this fistula, you'll find that it is relatively deep in this area. Normally, you'd like for a fistula to be 0.5 to 1 centimeter in depth and no more. This fistula only has a short segment here that is superficial enough to lend itself to easy cannulation, and for this reason, it appears that they're cannulating on the same sites over and over again, causing aneurysms. After that, we'd like to direct our attention to the, the fistula itself and begin the more specific part of the physical examination. The first thing we'd like to do is identify the anastomosis. That's going to be the point of maximum thrill. A thrill is the buzz that you feel over the fistula. And the point of maximum thrill is here. So this is where the vein has been uh, attached to the brachial artery. We, in, in feeling of that, you'd like to pay special attention to the diastolic component because as stenosis develops, resistance downstream from the anastomosis begins to increase. With that increase in resistance, the diastolic component of the thrill begins to drop out and become shortened and may completely disappear. She has a relatively good diastolic component, which is a good sign. The next thing we'd like to do is look at this uh, portion of the fistula that's immediately adjacent to the anastomosis. This is a section that we refer to as the juxta anastomotic fistula. It's a, this is where the fistula has been manipulated by the surgeon, and it's a common area for stenosis to occur. I don't detect any stenosis there, but if it were there, what we would notice is that the portion of the fist, fistula that's distal to that stenosis would be very hyperpulsatile. The thrill would be diminished. 
and you might feel a, a marked drop off in the caliber of the fistula at that point. This I don't see as abnormal at all. Then we move up to the body of the fistula and feel of the pulse in the fistula. Normally we should feel essentially no pulse or a very soft pulse. You have to be careful and not occlude the fistula with your hand and create an obstruction that's going to result in a pulse. The basic principle here is that pulse is bad. Pulse means downstream resistance or stenosis. Thrill is good. Thrill means flow. Now she does have a soft pulse, perhaps a little bit more than what you'd like to feel, but it's certainly not hyperpulsatile. And I think it's related to these aneurysms. You get an area of relative stenosis where the neck of that aneurysm comes down, and I think that's what we're feeling. And then the fistula goes deep, and this portion of the fistula is essentially unusable. The next thing we'd like to do is check the inflow. If you totally occlude the fistula and feel of the pulse, it becomes augmented. Or pulse, we call this pulse augmentation. And the fistula is said to augment well or augment poorly. Here, if you watch my finger, you can see how much pulse we're seeing when I occlude this fistula. This fistula augments well meaning that it has good inflow. To check the outflow, you can simply raise the patient's arm above the level of their heart, raise it in this fashion, and see if it collapses. Even a large fistula, one that's quite dilated, should collapse at least partially and become very flabby. And this one does. This area especially is very soft, very flabby with the arm elevated. And what that tells us is that there is no stenosis all the way up to here of any significance. So by doing pulse augmentation, elevating the arm above the level of the heart, we can check inflow and outflow in a very quick maneuver. So in summary, as we look at Martha's fistula here, we see that she actually has a, a relatively good brachiocephalic fistula. It does have a couple of, of problems of minor consequence in that she does have uh, two uh, aneurysms that are being caused by repetitive cannulation in the same area. But she doesn't have any area evidence of stenosis and her inflow looks very good. She might be a good candidate for buttonhole technique because of the limited fistula available for cannulation. But overall this looks like a good fistula and it should serve you well for a number of years. Thank you very much.